Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Eric, good to see you again. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to be able to catch up sometime and uh, be able to just swap stories and families. Uh, Jim, thanks for the invitation. And um, wherever you went, can't find it. There he is right there. Um, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be able to be here, to be able to talk a little bit about this. Uh, we are in a crisis on our southern border. Everyone knows it. It's on television all the time. But I think what people don't realize is what has changed on our southern border. I've been on our southern border about 12 times uh, to be able to visit with different leaders there, to be able to talk through what are the issues, uh, how do we actually answer some of the challenges that we have. And it's interesting because every time I go, I start with the same question with the people that I visit with, and that is what's changed since I was here last. Now, there is a joke on the southern border, I have to tell you, if you've been to one place in the southern border, you've been to one place in the southern border because it is different in Yuma, Arizona, than it is in Brownsville, than it is in Eagle Pass, than it is in McAllen. It's different in each place because different cartels run the southern side of that. And they behave differently, and they recruit from different countries, and they actually pull people in differently on that. So when you get to any spot and you ask, what's happening on the border, they will most often tell you, well, I can tell you what's happening right here, but I can't tell you what's happening 50 miles from here because that's probably a different cartel and they're operating it differently with a different method. And so the first thing I would say about the border is don't let anyone just say the border is one continuous, simple, clean, that, that's how it operates. But what was interesting is the last time I was there, uh, or actually several times ago that I was there, I guess now, uh, the response came back differently to me was we are seeing more individuals that are non-Spanish speakers that are coming. Mm -hmm. Which set something off for me to say, there's a shift, because that's the first I've heard it. And I didn't just hear it from Border Patrol agents. I heard it from the NGOs. I heard it from the folks in town. They were saying, we're used to seeing Spanish speakers coming through. We're seeing more and more non-Spanish speakers coming through. And when you see the statistics, you just see the numbers. And to see, for instance, yesterday, we had 6,300 people illegally cross our border yesterday. You just see a number. But what you don't see are the facts and the details behind it. In the last four and a half months, we've had more than 50 people now that have been picked up that are on our terror watch list in the last four months. If I go back to a few years ago, we would have had three in a year. We've had 50 in the last four months. We've had more than 10,000 individuals that have come across in the last four months that are listed as a national security risk. Uh, you'll see the term special interest alien is the term that you'll see most often. If you'll check the definition of that, they are defined as a national security risk. Why? They're coming from villages, areas where there's known active terrorist cells, but we don't have any information about this particular person. So they're not on our terror watch list, but they come from a family, a tribe, a community, a clan that is connected with terrorism, but we just don't know anything about them. More than 10,000. Of those 10,000, the vast majority of them were released into the country. They are somewhere in the United States right now. So when I talk to people about what's happening on the border, there are some people that address it as if we were five years ago, thinking about peak numbers in 2019, where we had 4,000, 4,500, at some days 4,600 people illegally crossing the border in 2019 in that peak time under the Trump administration. But the vast majority of those individuals were Spanish-speaking individuals coming from the Western Hemisphere. Now we have days where we have more than half of the people coming are not from the Western Hemisphere anymore. They're coming from Russia, they're coming from China, they're coming from Pakistan, they're coming from West Africa, they're coming from the Middle East, they're coming from all over the place. And they're individuals that are coming into our country that we know no facts or information about, have no criminal background check to be able to verify what has happened in their country, and what their behavior in their country before they came here. This has shifted from what was historically an employment issue and just a traditional issue on immigration to being a very rapid national security issue. And it's the bell that I've continued to be able to ring over and over again, and why I've pushed so hard to say, I understand we've talked about this issue for a long time. This is getting really serious. We have got to shift and to be able to solve this issue. And we can. If I go back to ancient history, long time ago, 2012, way back long time ago, in 2012, we had 21,000 people that year on our southern border ask for asylum. I'm going to let that just soak in. In 2012, 21,000 people that year asked for asylum. We now have that every three days. Mm. 
And what I challenge the Biden administration, I don't just challenge them to say enforce it like President Trump enforced it. I ask them to enforce it like President Obama enforced it. Just do that. So they have executive authorities they're not using, but every president now for the past five presidents has also asked for additional authorities dealing with asylum because we do have very weak laws. Today, right now, crossing our border, there are a couple things that are happening that I can tell you with great confidence happening right now. It's a morning, so here's what's happening on our southern border. There are folks coming across in large groups that have been brought up, uh, brought up across, some of them from Western Hemisphere, like it's typical of what's coming in McAllen right now, what's coming in, in, in Arizona right now, are people from all over the world that they'll fly into Mexicali. They're arranged by Turkish groups that often will arrange for different flights to be able to travel multiple different countries, land. They're coming from everywhere all over the world. They'll pay the cartels there. They'll literally have luggage, walk across the border there, and they'll check in with the Border Patrol. Their first words will be, I have fear in my country. That meets the minimum standard to be able to now get screened for asylum. They'll be released into the country depending on what city they want to go to, and they get to choose what city do you want to go to for your hearing. They'll be between somewhere between five and 11 years that they'll wait for their hearing. They can travel anywhere they want to in the country during that time period. They've not had any screening for any criminal background check. They've not had any other evaluation. They were 10 printed with fingerprints to see if they're on our terror watch list. If they're not, they're released into the country. And they can, six months from now, get a work permit and they can work anywhere they want to in the country. They can travel anywhere they want to in the country. And they can't be deported because they have a piece of paper saying, I'm awaiting an asylum hearing. If they don't show up for that asylum hearing, which I don't know if anyone's a wagering person, if you'd like to go ahead and take that wager, they're going to show up uh, 10 years from now. But if they don't show up for that hearing, in all likelihood, no one's going to hunt for them because they're somewhere in the country working somewhere. No one's going to reevaluate their work permit because they're working somewhere. And when they got there, they had a legal permit to be able to work. And no one will go back and review because most employers don't go back every three or four years and say, are you still legal? They just know when they checked in, they did have a work permit at that time. When it expires and they didn't show up for their hearing, no one's really checking in. And as long as they live under the radar, they're going to continue to be able to be here forever. That's one section of it. The other section, the folks that are coming through across our border right now, that when a group of 50 to 100 cross our border, Border Patrol all come in, the cartels have overhead with drones. This is a true story uh, right now across our border where they're watching the Border Patrol come in, pick up the group of 50 to 100 that are moving across, and as they all come in to be able to watch it, then a group of five or six individuals dressed in camo about two miles across the desert or two miles up the river will come sprinting across because there's no personnel to be able to pick them up. They're carrying backpacks, and we have no idea what they're carrying. That's happening right now, because it happens day after day after day. And there's no way to be able to track that. So when people say what's happening on our southern border is a national security issue, it's not just for individuals that are coming in from all over the world that are coming in from known areas of terrorism. It's also the amount of drugs that are now coming into our country rapidly, rapidly, because if they can move large groups of migrants, be able to see the Border Patrol come in and take care of the humanitarian issue, the rest of the border is open. The Border Patrol will tell you they can see on infrared cameras people moving, but they literally don't have enough personnel to be able to get to them. So why do I sit down across the aisle and actually do the work to say, how do we solve this problem? Because we have a national security issue. We have a rapid rise in drugs into our country, and we know how to stop it. It's actually enforcing our southern border. That's the way to be able to actually stop it. Now, I don't know if you've heard this rumor, but the Senate requires bipartisan conversation. I don't know if you've heard that. <laughs> I have lots of folks that catch me and say, do H.R. 2. It's a great bill. Pass that one. I'll say it is a great bill. How many Democrats voted for that in the House? Hmm. Correct answer would be zero. How many Democrats voted for that in the Senate? Correct answer would be zero. We didn't even get every Republican in the House and the Senate to vote for H.R. 2, much less get a single Democrat. And the desire is, compel Democrats, bend them to your will. <laughs> Make them actually pass this bill in the Senate. And I think, have you met them? They're as stubborn as I am. So they're, they're not going to just move and bend to my will on it to be able to do that. You've got to actually sit down and negotiate. And I fully understand that some of my colleagues want to eat just a 20-ounce ribeye, and anything less than a 20-ounce ribeye is insufficient. And what I brought back was a 10-ounce ribeye with a salad next to it. 
And they're like, I don't want any salad, and I want a 20 ounce ribeye or nothing. The bill that we sat down and we worked on for four and a half months had no amnesty in it at all. None. It's the first time a bipartisan negotiation came back without amnesty being attached to it. Because the focus is really on border security. And the main focus is, how do we clarify asylum? As I tried to say, we're playing Where's Waldo here. We have thousands of people coming across. Some of them actually do qualify for asylum, but it's not very many. It's really not. So how do we find the individuals that really do qualify for asylum, process them in a faster way, and take everyone else and turn them around? So we raised the standard for asylum. We added three new exclusions, new bars uh, to the process at the beginning. We raised the evidentiary standards. So you can't just say, I have fear in my country and be released. All that stopped. We did a very rapid process of actually screening at a higher standard so we could deport people faster. The best way to be able to deal with the mass influx of people coming in is to deport the folks that don't qualify and turn them back around because they will immediately tell their family, this doesn't work anymore. I've been at the border, some of you have as well, when they cross the border, they literally will take a picture of their paper where they're getting released, text it back to their family and say, this is the cartel I paid, this is where I crossed, this is what I said, I'm headed to Chicago to go work with my brother, come join me. It worked. As soon as they text back the deportation slip and say, it didn't work, the next group doesn't come. That's how it works in real life on it. People come when they know the United States of America is open. People will come legally when they determine there is a way to be able to come to the United States. It's a legal way to do that. So you raise the standard for asylum significantly. We added a new thing called um, expedited, re or expedited removal non-custodial. It's a nice clever term, okay? Right now you have expedited removal, but you can only do it in detention. Some days you don't have enough detention space, though we dramatically increased detention space. So we did the same expedited process, non-detained, especially to deal with families that come, because you're not going to hold families for long periods of time. You just can't do that legally on it. So we want to be able to have an expedited removal, non-custodial, so we can do removal within weeks rather than within years. We changed the process of how we did this to be able to make sure it's very clear to everyone. We want you to come if you actually qualify for asylum. If you're gaming the system, you need to go through a legal route. We also changed the parole process. Today, there'll be 1,500 people that will be given a work permit at one of our border crossings. They're given a work permit because they signed up in advance and told them their name. They don't qualify for asylum. There's no other standard. They could be from anywhere in the world. If you will tell DHS your name that you're coming in advance, you'll get a work permit when you come. So there's 1,500 people a day that are getting a work permit literally today just for signing up in advance. We stopped that. And we said, okay, that's actually a draw to more illegal immigration. There is a way to be able to get work permits. It's not like that. That's something literally Congress never even contemplated. So we stopped the abuse of parole in this document and changed that. We also had an emergency authority, and this is the one everyone freaked out over and said, you're letting 5,000 people a day into the country illegally. And I said, uh, actually, no. Here's what happens to the emergency authority. The first day, the first person that crosses, they are detained, they are screened, and they are deported. That's what happens. First day, first person. But if we get overwhelmed and we're getting 5,000 people, we don't have enough staff to be able to screen. So we literally take away, at that point, due process, and you're just detained and deported. That's the difference between 1,000 and 5,000. At 1,000, you're detained, screened, deported. At 5,000, we don't have time anymore, you're just detained and deported. That's what everyone freaked out over. I was like, I'm struggling to be able to find the problem here. Now, you may say, I don't want to do due process to people at 1,000. Okay, well, let's have that argument. We were actually queued up to be able to have an amendment. You might have heard of those before. We used to do those a long time ago, amendment votes. We were actually queued up to do an amendment series to be able to talk about this and to say, let's see if we can drive that number down. But in our negotiation, 5,000 is as low as we could get it. That was the true crisis moment where we've got catastrophic numbers coming across. By the way, that's today, I'm sure, because it was yesterday. It was the day before. In the last five months, we've had seven days less than 5,000 seven days, which would have been, would have been an emergency action today, we would have been yesterday, we will be tomorrow. But instead, we passed nothing, and so another 7,000 people are going to cross 
today again. We have to actually sit down and look at each other, come to agreement, figure out how we're going to solve problems, because there's another problem right behind it. And as I've said to my colleagues, this is the easiest of the hard things. We have debt to deal with. We have Social Security to deal with. We have Medicare to deal with. We have harder things than this. If we can't do the easiest of the hard things, we're in a difficult spot. And it is going to require grown-up, conservative, republic decisions to say, in a republic, you sit down with people you disagree with, you figure out how to be able to solve the problem, you solve it, and move to the next problem. Leaders were elected to do hard things. So let's do hard things. That's what we're supposed to do, even when it takes a long time. I have one thing, I'm going to open this up for questions for a moment. I have noticed it only takes one to make a press conference. But it takes 60 to actually pass a bill in the Senate. So I challenge my colleagues, I understand two or three people can get together and have an awesome press conference. We need 60 to get together and start making law because we got to fix some of these issues. Let me open this up. Hi, thank you. Right. I thought your uh, diagnosis on the border was, was spot on, and uh, I'm one of those who thinks that we should pass that. We have the President of the United States meeting with the top four leaders later today. And to be blunt, uh, and I'm a lifelong Republican, the Democratic leader, Democratic in both bodies, and the President seem to work very well uh, with you uh, to try to produce this bill. And they also work very well with House Republicans on a tax bill. And yet, the biggest problem we have right now is House and Senate Republicans don't want to work together. Or there are segments of their conference that don't want to do this. So we are going to go into November elections. We're not going to have appropriations bills done. I don't know if we're going to have Taiwan, Ukraine, Israel funding. I don't know if we're going to have a tax bill. How does that change? You served in the House. You've served in the Senate. How do you get McConnell and Johnson to actually work together where Johnson's not blasting the agreement out of the, out of the Senate and McConnell's like, I don't want to do the, Senate, the House's tax bill. So we are very frustrated downtown because this is a fight more among Republicans than it is with Democrats. It is, Thanks. actually. Uh, I, I described to someone back home last week uh, that I felt like on the border security bill, um, I had worked with all the other conferences. Oh, let, let me back and just say context on this. Some members stood up and said when the bill came out on the border security bill, I was totally surprised. I had no idea. I hadn't seen it since Sunday. I met personally with every single Republican, sat down with him, talked him through all the details five weeks before it came out, as we're finalizing text. So we went through every section of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, both the salad and the steak. And we talked about, okay, what, what, what else, you know, what would this look like and, and everything else. Everyone knew what was in that bill. Everybody knew what was in it. So anyone you heard that said, I was surprised, well, that's a surprise to me because I remember sitting down with him personally and talking through it. So I took a long time to go through every single one of our members in the conference. So that, that's one aspect of it. So when I called the play as the quarterback that day and my own line turned around and sacked me, <laughs> that was definitely a surprise to me uh, because everybody was fully aware what the play call was. So. For me, the challenge that we have right now is this sense of an activist base that says, I want everything or I want nothing, and nothing is better than something, does not align with many people across the country. Because many people across the country are saying, these are hard problems, do something. Don't just stand there, do something. When I was back home the last two weeks on it, traveling around the state the last week a lot, I was overwhelmed with the number of people that came up to me randomly in stores and restaurants and gas stations and everywhere else and said, thanks for trying to get something done. It's just very interesting to me. Politically right now, we're listening to the noise that says, do nothing or get everything. And we're not going to ever get everything. So I don't know where that goes and how we actually solve this. I also have great pity for the speaker because he is functioning every single day on the edge of a knife, every day. Um, 12 years ago, I was in the house. I made my first international trip. It was actually to Israel. And I can remember as a youth pastor, as we talked about before, 
my, and people talked about me, when did you feel like you were in Congress? Because there is that moment, you know what I'm talking about, Eric, where you suddenly realize, I was elected, that's not it. There is some other moment. I was actually in Israel, meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister at that time as well, sitting in his office, talking about the relationship between the United States and Israel, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm really in Congress. I need to be serious here, okay? The, 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 I, I, need to, I need to make sure that I'm speaking for our nation, but I'll never forget a part of that conversation. He said, there are a lot of things that Israel can share with the United States. Our form of government is probably not one of them. He said, we have, at that time, 13 political parties, and every Monday, we meet as a leadership group, and there is a vote of confidence or no confidence every Monday for the prime minister. So every week, the government could collapse, and we could have new elections. I've thought about that a lot for Mike Johnson right now, because he is currently functioning like a prime minister in Israel that every single week the government could collapse and they could reform a new government. And so he's trying to be able to figure out who's maddest this week and who do I take care of this week to keep the government from collapsing and reforming again. I don't know how this gets better until we as Republicans decide we're going to solve problems. Right now, we're attacking the people, attacking the problem. And that's not healthy for us. And I think the country will respond to that in the way, in some ways, the country should. Go fix things. That's why you're there.